This is the year 5012. The sudden aerial invasion of Earth by aliens carved in machine life forms led mankind to the brink of extinction. The surviving number of humans who took refuge on the moon to organize a counterattack using androids called Yoarha soldiers to recapture Earth. While in a tough battle, 2B is losing all allies' units, making her assume the role of mission captain, especially after losing 1D. These losses are making it difficult to complete the mission, and 2B is ordered to rendezvous with 9S on site to gather terrain intel. After, the plan remains the same, seek to destroy the target the Goliath-class weapon and gather more information. 9S receives a call from Operator 21 who tells him that there is a confirmed infiltration of Yoarha soldiers into the enemy base from a descent operation and only one unit remains. He is ordered to head over and assist the attack squadron that infiltrated. After suffering damage to her flight unit and having to abandon it, Tubi still fights her enemies with ease, just with a katana in hand. When it seems that all the enemies have been defeated, a bigger and more powerful one appears, which proves to be more of a struggle for 2B to fight, even if she handles it well, it's hard for her to defeat it until 9S shows up to help her. Both 2B and 9S thought, at first, that the giant enemy they defeated was the Goliath-class weapon that she is after since it looked so powerful, but it turns out to be just a defense unit. 9S implies that he will be looking for the target with her, and since he has a flight unit he will look around the perimeter for it while 2B investigates inside the facility. 9S reports that the place they are currently in was supposedly a weapons factory for humans, but the enemy seems to be using it to increase the production of machine lifeforms that just absentmindedly sit there. No one knows exactly what they are doing there, and there is no intel about sleep functions in machine lifeforms from the analysis team. Life form machines aren't the same as 2B and 9S, who are androids, but before he can elaborate on it, 2B interrupts him, a bit annoyed about his storytelling. 9S is a scanner, and they usually work alone while dealing with preliminary scouting, so he feels happy that he finally has someone to talk to. But 2B is quick to shut it down, telling him that they are forbidden from harboring emotions. 9S has identified the location of the enemy core unit and will be guiding her there. However, even though he sees that the core unit is there, he can't find any weapons that look like the target, making him wonder if the intel from command was incorrect. While 2B goes down to where 9S tells her the core unit is, she notices something but their connection gets cut off, and he only gets to hear her say that the unit core is outside. Outside, 2B runs in the direction of the core unit signal when the Goliath-class weapon finds her first. Upon being faced with the Goliath-class weapon, 2B immediately requests backup, but communication is impossible due to radio jamming. Since the weapon appears to be incomplete, 2B decides to fight it but gets swiped away by 9S, who attacks it with his flight unit instead while carrying 2B, decreasing the functionality of the Goliath-class weapon. He hacks the weapon and is faced with a protective wall that he breaks with the most ease. 9S finds out that the weapon is recovering much faster than he thought, resulting in him getting attacked by surprise before the weapon temporarily ceases functions. 2B runs to save 9S, who fell from his flight unit after being attacked, and finds him unconscious on the floor, missing half a leg and an arm, and with a metal stick through his stomach. Even though 2B requests aid to help him, he refuses it and hands his flight unit to 2B before the enemy reboots. 2B fights the Goliath-class weapon once again, with the help of the flight unit before making the bold move of jumping out of it and landing her katana on it. When we all think that she finally defeated it, it came back once again, determined to kill. 9S pulls out his black box and urges 2B to do the same. He requests the annihilation of the enemy via a black box reaction, and they touch their black boxes, creating an explosion. In a monologue, 2B says that all existence is designed to become extinct, and we are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. She wonders if it is a curse or a punishment, and her only wish is for 9S to be happy. They meet again, and their mission was a success, but 9S only backed up 2B's data, resulting in him losing memory of everything that happened after their rendezvous. 
There has been a massive alien invasion from outer space that uses as weapons machine lifeforms that have caused the destruction of human civilization. The few humans who survived had to flee to the moon to save their lives. There has been a counteroffensive operation from the bases positioned in satellite orbit by using the android, but even after more than a dozen of large-scale airborne operations, they have failed to give a decisive blow to the enemy. This is what all the Yoarha exist for, they are the final weapon of the war that has settled. The streets are deserted and in ruins, and on the floor lay several robots, all of them destroyed and inoperable, except for one, who gets up and recognizes its surroundings, starting to walk, as it walks, it passes by more robots who are still operable and they join it. Soon, there is an army of them, a voice tells us that we can see them, their shape and form, but no soul can be seen. Endless observation taught the machine what confusion is, but at the same time, the joy of knowing it makes the machine complete. A human attacks the same robot, but upon running out of bullets and seeing that the machine hadn't reacted to the attacks, he picks up his unconscious friend and leaves. A smaller robot comes out of the shadows, calling the bigger one brother. Are the machines gaining a new level of consciousness that lets them recognize each other as family? The bigger robot picks up a flower that was in its way, and through a screen we can see it typing about the flower, saying that it had found a little thing called flower that was drawn on that paper. Looking at the flower, an error message shows up through its vision saying detected emotion matrix, so we can assume that these robots are capable of having emotions of their own. A group is patrolling for movement from the robots, which hasn't been any in that zone, but still, they should be on the lookout for it, as they don't know when it could be happening. One of the men asks if they still think they have a chance, to which his friend tells him not to worry, as he had heard that they will be introducing a new model of android called Yoarha and the war could be over soon. A new character named Lily turns off the radio, which was giving information about the new androids and how the war could be over soon. Lily is tired of hearing the people on the moon say these things, which give them false hope, as the humans left on Earth, the Resistance, have been fighting on the ground for hundreds of years and they don't even give them one gun. Besides, with the recent evolution of the life form machines, she doesn't believe that this war will be ending anytime soon. After finishing the maintenance and being awakened by 9S, 2B goes to the commander. The commander lightly lectures 2B on her reckless behavior for using the black box to annihilate the enemy. 2B and 9S already have an assignment and are required to meet the resistance on the ground and gather intelligence. A job of liaison with the resistance that was assigned to other Yoarha members, but they can't get in touch with the previous one in charge. 9S and 2B's job is to find out why. At the resistance's base, the two men that were talking earlier were right about not being sure when an attack from the life form machines would happen, as an attack from an army of them happens. Lily gathers everyone who is still alive from the attack and they lure the robots to a bridge that they have covered in explosives in an attempt to defeat the army. As the bomb detonates and the robots go flying out of the bridge, the robot we have been following lands next to a flower, just like the one it had seen before. And it tries to reach it before his hand falls from its body, and its body falls from the cliff. The bomb on the bridge had been detonated not by the resistance, who were having trouble detonating it, but by 9S and 2B. Lily gets shocked when she sees 2B getting out of her spacecraft, could it be that they have known each other? As everyone from the Resistance is excited to see the new Yoarha androids, Lily is the only one who doesn't seem to trust them and rushes to go back to the base. It seems like there is a history behind 2B and Lily. After 9S and 2B rescue the Resistance members, they accompany them to their base. Outside they come across one of the parts of the Goliath machine lifeform. They give a warm welcome there and seem to get along well with the workers. That's when one of them asks 9S about the back that he is carrying on his back. Interestingly, he does not give a direct answer and claims that it is a secret. Later, the duo meets Lily who appears suspicious of 2B for some reason. 9S notices this and even asks if she knows her, but before he could answer Lily is interrupted by Jackass. 9S and 2B then accompany Jackass to a mission in the desert where they are supposed to investigate multiple machine lifeform sightings. In the meantime, 
Commander White finally reveals the real reasons for sending 9S and 2B to help the Resistance. It turns out that Assistance requests did not motivate her to send them but instead the desire to use the Resistance as a decoy was the main factor. Commander White feels that it is impossible to fulfill every Assistance request since it can cause hindrances in other operations. In the desert, 2B and 9S accidentally come across a machine life form. Although 9S manages to hack it, he witnesses a strange ceremony that shakes him to the core. After 9S witnesses the strange ceremony after managing to hack the machine life form that he and his comrades encounter in the desert, he is at a loss for words to describe what he is witnessing. Luckily, 2B manages to destroy it before it could potentially hurt someone on their team. But just moments later two much smaller machine life forms emerge from underground but appear to rethink their decision to confront their enemies. They show signs of panic, which is strange considering they should not have feelings, before running away. 9S, 2B, and Jackass reach an abandoned human housing complex while trying to catch them. Interestingly, some unidentified radio disturbances cause communication problems in the region. They soon end up at a place where they find bodies of countless androids along with machine lifeforms. The place appears to be a graveyard of machine lifeforms and suddenly 9S notices an inexplicable reaction from underground. As the land under their legs begins to sink, they end up in a strange underground dungeon-like place where they find small machine lifeforms strangely imitating human emotions. 9S feels that he cannot allow things to go on like this and decides to destroy each machine lifeform there. However, the hostile reaction leads to a strange chain of events in which the machine lifeforms rush toward a central body that is spherical in shape. Eventually, it opens up and a machine lifeform appearing almost human-like appears out of it. 2B and 9S are quick to attack it. Interestingly, it bleeds just like a normal human being after it is attacked and falls helplessly to the ground. But another similar-looking machine lifeform emerges from the corpse and unleashes a brutal attack following which 2B and 9S appear to contemplate retreating. Opening with the machine lifeforms doing weird-ass machine lifeform shit, they're putting on a play. Machine lifeforms play the roles of characters and act out the parts, machines sit in the seats and watch and applaud, and a captive audience of flayed but still alive androids are strung up around the theater. 2B and 9S return to the resistance base and give their report, with talk of machines evolving to a state they feel something like emotions, Lily and Jackass wonder if there's an opportunity to at least negotiate a ceasefire. But here's where 9SS programmed orthodoxy is laid bare, there will be no ceasefire or quarter given, the mission of all androids is to wipe out every last machine and reclaim Earth for mankind. Perhaps due to the fact her memory file is longer than his or possibly because she's been doing a little evolving of her own, 2B doesn't fall into lockstep with this hardline view. Their next recon mission from Commander White takes them to an active and bustling amusement park full of non-hostile machines. They find the black box signals of the androids in the theater and are ambushed by a giant mutated machine life form that has taken on a prima donna personality and wears the still living android bodies like jewelry. A vicious boss fight ensues, with 2B and 9S just barely able to keep up with its myriad attacks, they're also enclosed within an energy field, so retreat is not an option. 2B covers 9S as he tries to hack the machines, but he ends up overwhelmed and controlled by the imagery within the boss machines' brain as if it's hacking him. There he finds that personality that constantly needs affirmation that they're beautiful, which nearly leads to him being swallowed up by a giant mouth and into the spinning meat grinder within. He's saved at the last second by 2B. 2B didn't have any other options, and seemingly comes out of the situation none the worse for wear, she exposes the boss core and the pod blasts it to smithereens. Not long thereafter, a machine mother with a bouquet of roses and her daughter arrive, the mom pleads with the androids not to harm them, as they only came to watch the play. 9S chilling reaction underscores his inflexibility when it comes to any kind of negotiation of compromise with the machine lifeforms, he walks up to the two machines, crushing the roses under his boot, and destroys them both, then turns to 2B and tells her they can't hesitate. Lily sends 2B and 9S on a delivery mission that takes them through a derelict shopping center, the extreme wide shots that dwarf the two androids, the merging of nature and the man-made, 
and that terrific Okabe Keiichi score all conspire to set the mood exquisitely as always. After showing his cruel side when he extinguished the machine lifeforms family, 9S seems back to his chipper self, he dreams of a day when the fighting's over, the mall can reopen, and they can spend the day shopping for t-shirts. 2B says she has all the clothing she needs, and said emotions are prohibited. If last week's amusement park demonstrated that the machine lifeforms emulating humans without proper context results in a state indistinguishable from madness and psychopathy, this week's machine lifeforms village demonstrates that a more tempered and realistic form of humanity mimicry can be replicated by the android's enemy. Led by the green-eyed gentle giant Pascal, a large population of machines live in harmony completely severed from the machine lifeforms network. In a scene that is half Laputa, half Uok village, all shapes and sizes of machine lifeforms have their specific functions in the village, but rather than working like a well-oiled machine, their movements and behaviors are thoroughly human. They also have familial connections such as Big and Little Sister, 9S is simply astonished that Pascal is able to converse with them so eloquently. 2B and 9S are given freedom to explore the village, and when they find a ladder that plunges far below ground into the darkness. Thankfully there are no flayed androids, but there is a very strange large head that is neither android nor machine lifeforms, when 9S hacks it, a number of strange images of fellow androids flash by before his connection is severed. Pascal joins the two and notes that this giant head is the one who inspired him to stop fighting and is now an object of worship. 9S gathered enough data to identify it as a creation of humanity of your, perhaps also as a weapon, but like Pascal it seems to have found a new reason for its existence. The vivid palette of Pascal's memories is a neat contrast to the subdued earthy tones of the village. The more 9S observes this seemingly perfect society, the more he resents them as selfish for deciding to suddenly stop fighting a war both they and the androids were designed to fight. It's clear that like 2B, there's a part of 9S that wants the fighting to stop, and a part of him that believes it's the only reason he exists. For her part, 2B asks her assistant bot to properly map this place so that she and 9S can return someday to buy those t-shirts. 9S mood brightens when she says this, when the two return to the village to say their goodbyes, they see a group of machine lifeform kids bickering and getting violent over a music box one of them found, so like humans, the machine lifeform village isn't without its problems. As for Adam and his brother Eve, the two highly evolved machine lifeforms are evolving steadily, going from wearing tidy witties in the cold open to full-on pants and gauntlets in the parting shot. They don't just look dangerous, they look just like Yoarha androids. Lily keeps shooting looks 2BS way, and we learn that she once met an android that shared 2BS face, number 2, and previous generation model, 2 was a lot more animated in their speech, and she led an early Yoarha squad that, like the Resistance, had been hung out to drive by command. Back then Lily's Resistance squad was led by Rose, who decided to join forces with number two for a mission that neither of their groups could accomplish alone. While there was initial distrust on both sides, Rose's decision to cooperate rather than fight paid off and the family thus grew. There's both an 86 and iron-blooded orphans vibe to this group of misfit fighters who got the short end of the stick. Their familial chemistry and rapport with one another felt lived in and genuine, everyone supporting one another and staying in good spirits to distract from their unfair plight, one day Lily was not looking well at all, and her eyes suddenly turned red, a sign her data has been overwritten by a logic virus, by the look of it seems Lily and the other members of the resistance were also androids although it's not clear. But Lily definitely is, and even though Rose's first instinct is to kill her. Before the virus spreads, number 2 deflects that bullet, and eventually everyone helps hold Lily down so number 21 can purge the virus. But saving Lily delayed the combined unit's plan to infiltrate the target server facility, which is overrun by hundreds of thousands of enemies when they arrive, the bunker will not provide backup, but the mission must be executed no matter what, so one by one Lily's comrades sacrifice themselves so she can get to the server. She does, but at the cost of her entire family, including her big sister figure Rose, and the present Lily is far calmer, more composed and confident, but she remains haunted not by dreams, as Tubi says, 
Androids don't dream. 2B leaves Lily with a comforting rhetorical question, what if someone from her family were still alive out there, somewhere? And sure enough, a long-haired woman with the same beauty mark as number 2 and 2B is revealed to be still out there fighting the good fight. Emotions are prohibited, and yet Operator 60 contacts 2B to tell her she'd look good with a lunar tear, a kind of lily, in her hair. Pascal reports that little sister is missing after looking for parts for her big sister, 2B agrees to a side quest to find her. Pascal gives 2B and 9S a lift to the Forest Kingdom with his new flight attachments, and the androids learn that he can change out his body parts as needed, that leads to a talk about how much can be changed before Pascal is no longer Pascal. He believes that as long as the heart of someone, be they human, machine life form, or android remains, they are still themselves. Within the Forest Kingdom there's a sprawling ruined castle of brick and stone, but while the kingdom is supposed to be guarded by a fierce machine fighting force, nearly all are destroyed, and by someone who knew what they were doing. Various record ships held by the castle's defeated occupants contain not just a dispassionate record of events 256 and 128 years ago, but a history of their kingdom, from when their first king declared their kingdom, to when he died and was succeeded by a new little king. There's also a record of four hours ago, when the intruder is revealed to be a female android, as they're walking on a bridge high above a long drop, the stone beneath 9's feet crumbles, but Pascal saves him. 9S is shocked by this since he's been bad-mouthing Pascal and all machine lifeforms the whole time, and even afterwards he still can't fully trust him, but they eventually find the little sister, who has fallen in love with one of the castle guards and wishes to be married. With one side quest complete, the sister's new fiancé gives the androids another, save the little king, who is under threat from the intruder, they reach the throne room and find the king, the machine life form version of a baby in riveted metal swaddling clothes, but they are too late to save it, as it is run clean through by the blade of the female android intruder. The pod identifies this android as the ex-soldier A2, currently classified a deserter and a fugitive, after crossing blades and having hers shattered by 2B, 9S asks A2 why she betrayed command, A2 responds that command was the ones doing the betraying. When they return to the resistance base, 2B and 9S ask Lily if she's ever seen A2, whom Commander White has ordered them to pursue, investigate and ultimately eliminate. Since A2 saved her life, Lily lies and says she never heard of her, the Yoarha duo asks the quiet twin redheads Davola and Popola, who subs they ask Jackass. However Jackass is currently scouting in the flooded city that gives us yet another gorgeous, haunting establishing shot, along with some scenes of 2B and 9S dwarfed by their surroundings as they run and leap about the ruins. When 9S starts thinking and asking questions about 2A, like why she's still fighting him else if she's a deserter, 2B tells him curiosity could get them destroyed, so best not to think too much. Then 9S suggests they take a break, and he removes his boots, socks, and even visor to play in the water, 2B grudgingly follows him, since Jackass' signature is hidden for some reason, 2B and 9S split up to cover more ground. 2B is the one to find Jackass, who is absolutely rocking a bright red bikini as she fishes for mackerel, whose whale can prove fatal to androids, like Lily Jackass claims not to know 2A, when 2B fails to contact 9S due to jamming, we switch to 9S's POV. Turns out he split it from 2B so he could contact Operator 60, upload some photos for her hobby, and also hack into the bunker's monitoring systems, he eavesdrops on Commander White having an uncomfortable chat with Command about sacrificing someone, then Command notices a security breach and 9S is cut off. But it isn't Command that jams his signal from 2B and Jackass, it's 9S entering a weird room full of handmade drawings and paintings of him and 2B, including when they were waiting in the water just moments ago. 9S catches glimpses of long silver locks, and so assumes it's 2A, but the fact that Eve can't sense his elder brother indicates that that long hair actually belongs to Adam, who is lures 9S down a dark, creepy hall before knocking him out. 9S ended up, right in Adam's clutches, 
The trap takes the form of an endless matrix of hallways and doors, and Adam has all the keys, he stalks 9s then sidles right up to him and mocks 9s fondness for 2b, meanwhile 2b knows something is up, so she follows the pods to the art room where she finds specific coordinates. After a fuel call to the bunker for backup, she reaches the coordinates, a pure white copied city coalesces around her, she walks down streets, through a church-like structure filled with reliefs of humans and a grotesque construction made from captured Yoarha soldiers, Adam finally reveals himself with Panache. Adam reminds 2B that they met when he and his brother were first born, but that time 2B was trying to kill them on the spot, now he's in complete control, and like a cat with a mouse is content to simply mess with 2B in an attempt to get her to express emotions, 2B takes the bait when Adam shows her a crucified 9S at his mercy, and seems to feed off of her surge of anger and hatred, the two spar but it becomes clear that physical attacks are pointless, Adam can regenerate his body instantly, with 2B seemingly out of options, Adam produces a pure white copy of 9S. Though Adam is disconnected from the network and thus mortal, a group of 9S clones spring forth from the ground and restrain and choke 2B, but before she passes out her pod tells her the appointed time has come, 2B wasn't really trying to defeat Adam, she was only buying time for 9S pod to hack into Adam's system. Once it does the white city turns charcoal gray, the clones disappear and 2B is free to impale Adam with her sword, but Eve took the attack, Eve protects his big brother, 2B gets off relatively easy, her sword is destroyed, but Eve's blow merely blasts her out of the library as she saves 9S. But as he is also disconnected from the network, when he dies he seems to die for good. 9S is shuttled back up to the bunker for repairs. Commander White orders 2B to finish the job solo and destroy Adam. Adam is extremely blue and has no patience for a machine lifeforms dressed as a priest taking Eve's place at the brother's table. From the moment 2B arrives at a huge derelict factory festooned with religious banners, seething with proselytizing machine lifeforms zealouts spouting boilerplate dogma, the religious machine lifeforms get more and more fired up, while half of Adam becomes covered in tattoos. Suddenly the yellow eyes of every machine lifeform in the joint turn red, and 2B and her pods find themselves locked in a fight with a swarm of them, she does manage to escape to the elevator, whereupon she meets a still yellow-eyed machine life form, remotely controlled by 9S from the bunker. A giant spherical machine life form with several legs appears, 9S uses the machine life form to hack into the factory in order to shut off the power so the boss shields drop, sacrificing the machine life form unit in the process, 2B manages to defeat the boss, unfortunately she's surrounded all over again by the hordes of red-eyed machine life forms. Back at the bunker alarms are going off all over the place. Even in when White approves sending backup to 2B, comms are jammed, she's on her own, and when she releases the pod's limiters, they barely make a dent in the machine life form numbers before going into low power mode to recover. Fortunately these hordes of machine life forms aren't interested in 2B, and pass right by her as they dive into the tank of lava below, with the intention of becoming like Eve. The machine lifeforms in huge numbers quickly surround and overwhelm the resistance camp, 2B shows up to lend a much appreciated hand, and her pod downloads a new even bigger machine lifeform killing sword, Commander White goes to the plate for her soldiers, but the Council of Humanity refuses her request for logistical aid, citing a greater purpose. Even so 2B and the resistance are still able to activate an EMP that disables the advancing machine lifeform armies, Unfortunately after it starts to rain, all of those neutralized machine life form husks combine to form a colossal atom just as 9S returns in his mech. A resistance fighter fires a bazooka that topples Big Atom, but he simply transforms into a giant monster, with the newly two-toned atom lodged in its skull, rather than despair at the enemy's evolution, Lily rallies her troops and when they respond with unswerving loyalty, she looks the happiest and most excited she ever has. She believes they can defeat that big thing, while 9SS first hacking attempt on the monster ends with the destruction of his mech, he is caught in the dare by Pascal, who along with his village did not go berserk since they were cut off from the main network. 
While he may technically be breaking a Yoarha regulation, 9S done a heavy-duty hacking connector for his second attempt to shut the monster down, 2B is initially overmatched by her three elite Hyper Berserk machine lifeforms, but manages to trick them with a hologram of herself and slashes them to smithereens with her big sword. Pascal carries 9S to the monster's head so he can contact it directly with his gauntlet. Once he's hacked in, 9S quickly realizes that Adam is pretty much going mad, which explains why the machine life form and the monster are totally out of control. But as usual he's able to buy just enough time exploring the various metaphorical constructs thrown his way and stab the cyber atom at his flaming table, this causes the monster to start moving in the direction the resistance troops want, right into the line of fire of a salvaged railroad cannon. When the monster is thrown back, an ICBM launches it into the atmosphere, while it initially survives and begins to plummet towards the Earth, it appears to be finished off by a giant particle beam from an orbiting satellite weapon. When the pods detect a faint machine life form symbol, 2B and 9S ride them down into the blast area, where Adam is still alive but in rough shape, 2B prepares to finish the job, but hesitates briefly, as Adam recalls his promise to Eve and grabs her leg, 9S takes hold of 2B's sword and plunges it into Adam's head, defeating him for good. However moments later 9 seconds eyes turn red, the result of being infected by his hacking encounter with Adam, this means 2B has to kill him before he goes berserk, with no chance at backing up the personality of the 9S, she does her duty and eliminates the threat, afterwards 2B cannot help but weep at having to say goodbye to her friend once more. Fortunately for her it's only a temporary farewell, as all of the machine life form husks eyes start to glow green and sequence like fireflies, not only in her vicinity but all over the planet, a larger machine life form mech rises to meet 2B, who draws her sword but lowers it when she hears 9S voice. Turns out his uncorrupted personality data had been backed up in the machine life form network, 2B smiles in joy and relief, in a post credit scene, during his time getting repaired at the bunker, 9S connects with the bunker's server, sensing an anomaly, 9S prevents himself and 2B's data from syncing with the bunker server. As he investigates he accidentally triggers the server's defense system and he encounters twin girls wearing red dresses, who claim they are observing the androids and help 9S discover truth about Project Yoarha. He learns that humanity has long been extinct, and that Project Yoarha was created to raise android morale by fooling them into believing humans are still living on the moon, 9S then wakes up and responds to 2B's request for backup as he is secretly observed by the girl in the red dress. So this is the end of anime, don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed it.